Well, good morning once again. I want to invite you, as we normally do, to please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This morning's reading comes from the second chapter of the first book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 7. Please look at it with me. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Friends, this is God's word, and I believe with all my heart that it's true. Would you please pray with me? God, we lift this time to you. We ask for uh, all of us to be receptive to uh, you, Holy Spirit, how you are working in our midst. Speak to us through your word, and God, give us a new and and firm appreciation for Christ, the cornerstone today. God, we love you so much, and it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. To say that Scott was a regular would be an understatement. Because every single day in 1989, Scott would go to his favorite restaurant for lunch, a small diner called The Huddle in San Diego, California. And since he came every single day, Ruth Hendricks, the owner of this diner, got to know Scott very well. And the thing that Ruth noticed about Scott every day that he would come into the diner was how thin he was, and not in a good way. Something wasn't right. He looked kind of sick. And eventually, she got the courage just to ask him about his appearance, and she discovered that Scott was suffering from the disease AIDS, for which unintended weight loss is a very common symptom. And the reason why Scott came to Ruth's diner every day was because, as as Scott told Ruth, it was his daily source of nutrition. In fact, he said to Ruth that if he wasn't at her diner, he wasn't eating. And so Scott made it a point to get to the huddle every day to have a meal to get nutrition. Until one day, he didn't. Eventually, he stopped coming altogether. And since she knew the the huddle was his only source of nutrition, Ruth grew very concerned about Scott to the point that she began searching for him, trying to find him, because if he wasn't able to come to her restaurant, she was willing to come and bring him food so that he could keep on living. But her searching was to no avail. She never saw him again. But from this experience came the realization for Ruth that there were many other people in San Diego who were living with similar conditions, who were suffering like Scott was. And so the desire began to arise within Ruth's heart to do something about this, to do something to help them. And that's exactly what she did. In 1990, Ruth started Special Delivery San Diego, an organization that delivers breakfast, lunch, and dinner Monday through Friday to people living with conditions like AIDS or other chronic illnesses. Ruth still runs her restaurant, but right next door she has her Special Delivery Center where she she and her team of volunteers pack meals and serve fresh foods to those in need. And since its beginning, Special Delivery has now fed about 6,000 people over 1 million meals. And I actually had the 
privilege of meeting Ruth uh, back in the summer of 2013 when I worked in San Diego for an organization called YouthWorks. And at YouthWorks, what we would do is we would facilitate mission trips, uh, mission trip experiences in San Diego for various church youth groups. And one of the places that students could volunteer at was at uh, Special Delivery. And it was a really cool experience to be able to hear Ruth's story firsthand and actually volunteer in her ministry and even eat at her restaurant. Because here's what I admire about Ruth. Here's what really stood out to me about Ruth. For her, helping people in need wasn't just something she was going to do once or even occasionally. Trying to feed someone who was suffering from a debilitating illness wasn't a one-time occurrence or even just a job for her. <clears throat> for her, helping those in need became a lifestyle. It became something that defines who she is as a person, right? She still has her restaurant, but right next door is special delivery. It's incorporated into her business. It's a part of her daily life. Over 30 years ago, Ruth made the decision to live a life of service. Service for Ruth was a lifestyle. What's your lifestyle? What defines the way that you live? Right? A lifestyle is the way you live. It's the air you breathe. Every decision and choice that you make revolves around the lifestyle you want to live. If you want to live a healthy lifestyle, you're going to diet, you're going to exercise. If you want to live uh, whatever kind of lifestyle it might be, you're going to make decisions around that. And as we continue our series called Living Hope, we're going to see the kind of lifestyle that I think Peter says that Christians should have. So if you have your Bibles or if you have some kind of electronic device that you can pull up your Bible on because it's 2022 and we have those sorts of devices, I want to invite you to open them up with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. And the epistle of 1 Peter is a letter all about the hope we have in Christ. Jesus is our living hope. He gives us hope, and through him we can live with hope. And also, Jesus is our perfect hope. He is our only hope, our holy hope. As we dive into him and into his word, he transforms us by making us holy, making us more like him. And as we continue through this book, we're going to keep building off some of the themes that we've already covered, but also open up some new topics as well. So let's get into it. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 5. He says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what kind of lifestyle do we live as Christians? Peter describes it as a lifestyle of living stones. He says that Jesus is the living stone that we come to, and together we ourselves are living stones. And you might be thinking, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Excuse me? Come again? Like, what, what does that mean? Why, why does Peter call Jesus the living stone, and what in the world does it mean for us to be living stones? Well, the answer, I think, is that Peter is introducing a metaphor that he's going to quite literally build off of in this chapter, and that is Christ being the new temple. Jesus is the new temple. 
You might remember that Jesus used this metaphor to describe himself in John 2.19 when he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And those who heard him thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem, the place where the Jewish people would go to worship, to offer sacrifices to God. But what actually Jesus meant was the temple of his body, which would be destroyed, but in three days would rise again. He would rise from the dead. And so since Jesus is risen, Jesus Christ is now building a new temple on which he is the foundation, the cornerstone, the living stone. Though he was rejected by men, God has chosen him not to be some kind of dead monument, but rather a living, resurrected stone. And continuing the metaphor, those who come to Christ now gain the privilege of becoming uh, this spiritual temple of which he is the cornerstone. We are the building blocks of this temple. We are living stones built on the living stone. And this is what we call the church, right? This is what we call the people of God. As you probably know, the church is not just a building. It's not just a specific place, but it is in all reality a living, breathing organism. This is the new temple. And unlike the old temple, you don't have to be a priest or you don't have to go to Jerusalem to enter into the presence of God. This new house of worship is not confined to a certain place. It's not even confined to 188 Plum Street, but rather it is confined, it is not confined, but rather it is on the move throughout the entire world. As theologian Wayne Grudem puts it, the fact that Christ is the living stone shows at once his superiority to an Old Testament temple made of dead stones and reminds Christians that there can be no longing for that old approach to God, for this way is far better. With this in mind, we now, like living stones who make up the spiritual house or the church, come to Jesus to offer spiritual sacrifices. We draw near to worship. We offer sacrifices, but as the, the church, the kind of sacrifices we are to offer are much different than what they would have offered in the old temple, right? We don't sacrifice a goat, or we don't come to the altar and, and slaughter a calf as a, as a symbol of sacrifice to pay for our sins, but rather we now offer spiritual sacrifices, which can mean a number of things. A spiritual sacrifice could be dedicating yourself to God's service, as Romans 12.1 says. It could mean giving financial or physical gifts that help spread the good news of the gospel, according to Philippians 4.18. It could be offering a sacrifice of praise by singing hymns or worship songs, or maybe it's simply doing good things and sharing what we have with others in the name of Jesus, Hebrews 13, uh, 15 through 16 says. All this is to say that anything we do, in anywhere we do it, in service to God, in service to Christ, is considered to be a spiritual sacrifice or an act of worship. Worship is not simply one action that happens in one place. In this new temple, worship is a lifestyle. The lifestyle of living stones is worship. The lifestyle of the people of God is worship. Okay, great, you might be thinking. But how do we do that? What does that look like? How do you live a lifestyle of worship? How do you begin to embrace a lifestyle of worshiping God in all that you do beyond the walls of the church? Well, from the text, I think Peter lays uh, out for us three different aspects that will help you to live a lifestyle of worship. <clears throat> so let's get into it. I want to start back at the beginning of our passage. So check out with me verse 1 again. He says, so, and I'm going to stop right there. 
So, or based on what I just said, here's what you've got to keep in mind. Now, here's, what did Peter just say? Well, if you have your Bibles, just look back at the verses right before, verses 22 and 23 he said, of chapter 1. He says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for its sincere brotherly love, <clears throat> he says, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again <clears throat> through the living and abiding word of God. So because you have been born again, chapter 2, verse 1 says, because you have been born again, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So living a life of worship begins with a longing for growth. And like we touched on last week, we don't always want to grow spiritually, do we? We sometimes fail to take our holiness seriously. Sometimes we'd rather stay where we're at. We don't want to go through the work that maybe it takes to progress in living in holiness. But we have been born again, Peter says, to a living hope. And that should change everything, if that's true. In fact, Peter makes the point that as people who have been spiritually born, we should actually be like real newborns in our approach to spiritual growth. Peter says that we are to crave spiritual growth like a baby craves its bottle, like a baby craves milk. And if you've ever been around a newborn before, whether your kids or your grandkids, you know what it's like for them to crave their bottle, right? The only words that come to mind is it's like the world's going to end, right? The, the baby does not care about anything else except the bottle, right? It doesn't matter what time it is. It doesn't matter if they just ate an hour ago. It doesn't matter if it's in the middle of church. It doesn't matter if, if, if you just got into bed. It doesn't matter. That baby is going to scream bloody murder until it gets its milk. And there's only one thing that will satisfy that child. And so even if it's 3 a.m., you get out of bed and you warm up the bottle and you feed the baby it's milk. Can you tell this is something I'm personally going through right now? <laughs> the other night, Bethany woke up, and she was just screaming, and I'm just holding her like, is she going to explode? Like, what's going to happen? She wanted her bottle. <laughs> but as stressful as it might be to feed a screaming baby formula in the middle of the night, this is a good thing for the baby to desire. This is a good thing for the baby to let you know that he or she wants to eat. Because if the child didn't want to eat, that wouldn't be a good sign. That would be a problem. The baby craves milk because he or she needs milk in order to grow. They need to eat to grow. It needs to eat to grow. And this ties into the point that Peter is making. If you are a Christian, you should crave the spiritual milk so that you can grow. And don't get me wrong, this isn't just something that Peter is saying that only applies to uh, new Christians or even what we would call baby Christians. The spiritual milk that Peter is talking about doesn't mean something that's basic or elementary, but rather refers to that which is spiritually nourishing to the, to the believer, right? Such as the Word of God, or prayer, or fellowship with other believers, whether in a small group or at church. It's these things that help you grow in your faith. And so if someone were to look at your life, would they see you longing after the things that promote spiritual growth in your faith? Do you long for spiritual growth? Do you desire holiness? Does your heart genuinely desire to grow closer to God? Or are you content 
with complacency. A.W. Tozer was a famous theologian and preacher from the early 20th century, and in his little yet powerful book, The Pursuit of God, Tozer says this. He says, There are some who want to taste, to touch with their hearts, to see with their inner eyes the wonder that is God. And I deliberately want to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present low estate. The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. And then he says this. He says, complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. Friends, are you feeling stale in your spiritual life? Do you feel far from God? Perhaps the place to start is by assessing your inner longings. Perhaps the place to start is to examine your life and to see where have you grown complacent in your pursuit of Christ. Because when you genuinely long for something, nothing is going to get in your way. And it might not be waking up at 2 a.m to feed a screaming baby, but maybe it's waking up at 6 a.m. to read your Bible because that's the only time in the day it will fit. Or maybe instead of a a bottle for nourishment from from milk, maybe it's the spiritual nourishment of being a part of the women's group or or men's Bible study or making church attendance a priority in your life. Whatever it looks like, A life that is defined by worship begins with an inner longing, a desire, a craving to be close to God. A lifestyle of worship begins with a longing for growth. But there's more to it. Jump down with me in your Bibles to verse 6. He says, For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, and for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Now what is interesting about what we just read, the section we just read, is that Peter quotes three different Bible passages from the Old Testament. He quotes Isaiah 28, 16, Psalm 118, verse 22, and Isaiah 8, verse 14. But what all these passages do is show us the second aspect of living a lifestyle of worship, and that is laying the foundation of your life on Christ. Each of these passages are quoted to demonstrate how the Old Testament has prophesied about the coming Christ, the coming Messiah, who is described here as the cornerstone. And if you're not familiar, a cornerstone is an essential piece in the laying of a new foundation for a building or structure. And the cornerstone mentioned here is described in a very specific way. The cornerstone is to be laid in Zion, or where the Jerusalem temple uh, was located. And so, in other words, God is going to begin a brand new work that will replace the temple that is already there, something Peter has alluded to in verses 4 and 5. And the foundation of this new work, the cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. So a new temple is coming. With a new cornerstone. But the question is whether or not you will accept this new structure. In other words, Peter draws a line between those who believe in Christ, the living stone, and those who do not. He quotes Psalm 118, noting that the builders have rejected the stone, but it has now become the cornerstone. And if you read the Gospels, you will see that Jesus reference this very same passage when describing himself. For instance, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus tells a disturbing story to a group of religious leaders who are challenging his authority. 
He tells this story about a master of a vineyard who leased portions of his vineyard to various renters. When it was time to harvest the fruit, he sent, he sent out his servants to retrieve the fruit, but the tenant killed all of his servants. And eventually, the master sends his own son, thinking that these renters will respect his son, but instead he too is killed by these evil tenants. And he, Jesus concludes this disturbing parable by saying this. He says, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the, his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. You know, sometimes Jesus, when he would tell a parable, people would not have the slightest clue who he was talking about or what he was saying, and so Jesus would have to explain it to them. But in this instance, it was clear to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders that Jesus is pointing the finger at them because they have rejected him. Christ has become a stumbling block for them. In the same way, Peter is saying that all who reject Christ have stumbled over him in their disobedience to him. And so the encouragement for us is not to go that route. We are to put our hope in the living stone. We are to lay the foundation of our lives on Christ the cornerstone. And that means you don't build your life on something else. Because if you place something else as the cornerstone of your life, besides Christ, the building will fall. Your life will fall apart. If you build your life on your friends, on your family, or your kids, if you make that your primary identity, your life will crash once they reject you or fail you. If you build your life on your career, how much money you can earn in your lifetime, how much money you can save for retirement, your life will fall to pieces when you lose it. If you build your life on the praise of others, your life will be shattered when their words turn to criticism. A lifestyle of worship lays the foundation, builds itself upon the one who can sustain you through the storms of life. And that cornerstone, that foundation, is Jesus Christ. And here's the thing I really want you to see from this passage. Peter is writing this letter. He's saying all of this to a group of people who are very familiar with the sting and the pain of rejection. Right? Remember, they have been scattered all over Asia Minor because of the persecution that they have endured. But Jesus himself has been rejected by men. Yet he is chosen and precious in the eyes of God. And so I think Peter wants his readers, and I think he wants for us today, what God wants to show us today, what God wants to show you today, is for you to see yourself in the same way. You have been called by God to stand out in this world. And if you do that, this will cause you to be rejected in some way or another. Yet you can be encouraged because even in your rejection, you can know that you are chosen by God and you are precious to him. Jesus is the rejected savior of a rejected people. And so if you live a life of worship, by laying the foundation of your life on Christ the cornerstone, you will stand secure because he is the one who is ultimately in control. Well, there's one more aspect to all of this, so let's wrap up our passage. Again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's look at verses 9 through 12. <clears throat> he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him 
who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, flesh which wage war against your soul. <clears throat> Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. <clears throat> All of what we just read is Peter building upon what we talked about last week, namely that holiness is displayed in our good works. But did you notice what Peter, how Peter ends this section? He ends this section the same way that he began it in verse 1. By urging these people, by urging us to put away, to abstain from sinful behavior. Peter's clear. Being a Christian calls for a running away from the sinful things that we once sought after, that once dominated our lives. With that in mind, I want to close our time by focusing on verses 9 and 10. And not simply ask how we walk in obedience or how we live as a chosen people, but rather ask the question, why? Why did God choose us? <clears throat> why have we been elected to be a royal priesthood like the Levites were in the Old Testament? Why are we to be a holy set-apart nation like Israel was in the Old Testament? Why are we to be a people for his own possession? Why are we a peculiar people? Why are we now God's people? Why have we now received mercy? And really the greater question is why do we exist? What is the purpose of this new temple? What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of for Christians, for you, Christian? And the answer, I think, comes straight out of the text. Look again at the end of verse 9. He says, You are a chosen people so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Do you see it? The last part of living a lifestyle of worship is proclaiming the light. Proclaiming the light. We have been called out by God to, be, uh, to proclaim the excellencies of God. To share with others the goodness and the greatness of God. To share with others that we once walked in darkness, but we now walk in marvelous light. Our purpose isn't to bring glory to ourselves. Our purpose isn't to proclaim the excellencies of ourselves on Facebook or whatever it might be, nor is our purpose to tear others down in our conversations. No, our purpose is to proclaim the gospel, the fact that we have received incredible mercy from God through Jesus Christ. And by pro proclaiming, I mean a number of things. Proclaiming should be sharing the good news of the gospel, telling others about Jesus. Proclaiming should be praising God through prayer and worship, thanking Him for His goodness towards us. And proclaiming could be something even as simple as just sharing a, a verse on your Facebook page, something that could reach out to people around you, or a Christ-centered word of encouragement, whatever it might be. I don't think anything spells out a lifestyle of worship more than a Christian who is constantly proclaiming the goodness and the greatness of God to those around them, around him or around her. Proclaim the light. And so as we close today, my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we would live a lifestyle of worship that starts with an earnest longing for growth. It is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and that and that is defined by our proclaiming of the one who has called you and me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Would you please pray with me? God, we thank you 
And we praise you for your goodness and your greatness. And we thank you that you are a Savior who resonates with our weaknesses, who can resonate with our pain, who even has is the ability to resonate with our rejection for your name's sake. God, thank you that though the builders rejected you, though uh, the, the religious establishment rejected you, God, you have our chosen, Jesus, you were chosen by God to be a precious cornerstone. We thank you that our lives are not built on a shaky foundation, but that, God, we can build our lives on you, the cornerstone, the firm foundation. We will not be shaken. Even when the storms of life come, even when hardships come our way, God, you hold us firm and secure. So, God, we love you and we praise you. And sin. Your holy name we do pray. Amen.